Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's having a great week. This is uh, Patrick Stone. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy here at the National Psoriasis Foundation. Um, our purpose of today's webinar is to talk about the uh, wonderful and robust uh, patient protections in New York State that have been codified into law uh, following the passage of Senate Bill 3419C and Assembly Bill 2834D. Gotta love those high bill numbers in New York. Um, the protections passed will impact plans beginning in 2018, and we'll talk a little more about that. We're about, excited about the opportunities protections will provide, not only for patients in the state, but the ability to, for uh, providers to practice medicine as they know best. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, the bill sponsors, Senator uh, Kath, uh, Catherine Young and Assemblyman Matthew Titone, and the really large group of patient and provider groups that got this effort across the finish line. We'll talk about that again at the end. Um, should you have any questions uh, for our panelists, uh, please submit them through the questions feature. And with that, I want to introduce everyone. Um, our panelists today, uh, starting off, uh, is Dr. Uh, Medeski. And Dr. Medeski received a Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy from the School of Pharmacy, State University of New York uh, at Buffalo, and received his Doctorate of Medicine degree from the School of Medicine, uh, SUNY in, in Health Science Center in, in Syracuse. And he completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at the uh, same school. And he's an attending physician at Medina Memorial Hospital and serves on the hospital's Medical Quality Assurance Committee. Um, doesn't need much of an introduction. Mo Oster, who many of you know, uh, is the Senior Vice President and Chief, Chief Legislative Counsel of MISNI, the Medical Society of the State of New York. And his chief role is to develop and analyze legislation and regulations that impact upon delivery of care by physicians, particularly third-party payment issues, medical liability, Medicaid, and disciplinary and pharmaceutical issues. He's also extensively involved in coordinating the grassroots lobbying efforts of county medical societies and physicians across New York State on pending state and federal legislative issues. So thank you both of us for being here today. Um, cool. Real quick disclosures, we are offering um, CME credit for this webinar today. We're offering a half credit, which is great, and neither uh, myself or either of the other two presenters have any disclosures. Simple accreditation page to show that the, uh, the CME credit is available. Um, you know, as we start, I think I'll hand it over to Mo Oster with MISNI, who's going to provide a review of Chapter 512. That's the chaptered law that has been enacted to put patient protections in place and provides prescribing health care providers circum certain circumstances to override a health plan step therapy protocols. Mo, the stage is yours, sir. <clears throat> thank, you, thank you very much, Patrick. And, and frankly, when Patrick makes the point about like the D about you know 3419D and A2834, 2034E, it reflects the multiple drafts it took and the, and the great amount of work and the partnership that took place among both physician associations but also a whole plethora of patient advocacy organizations across the state of New York, such as the Psoriasis Foundation, MS, MS Society, uh, Crohn's, Lupus Association, Arthritis Foundation, who were all extensively involved in helping getting this legislation, work in this legislation for several years and ultimately being involved in helping to get this legislation passed by the legislature and signed into the law by, gov by the governor last year. Um, specifically, the legislation is designed to uh, better assure that physicians can override, um, can work to help assure that health plans, that the health plan step therapy protocols are overridden. As, as many of you are aware, these step therapy protocols are also known as fail first protocols, and they're policies which establish a specific sequence for prescription drugs uh, for a medical condition uh, to be approved by a health insurance plan. Um, essentially, what it means is that a health insurer may require a patient to fail first in that medication before they go to the alter alternative medication. And often these, the, these protocols are, are perfectly appropriate, and physicians follow them all the time in terms of prescribing medications for their patients, but there are certain circumstances, and which we will get into, when, when they, they, physicians should have the ability to make sure that their patients get the medications that they believe are most appropriate and to override these protocols. Uh, next slide, Patrick. 
again, as Patrick mentioned before, it was the, the law was sponsored by Senator Kathy Young um, and Assemblyman Matthew Tatone, um, and the bill adds new protections for uh, new protections to assure these step therapy protocols can be overridden in the in the appropriate circumstances. Uh, next slide. Now, the question is initially, which health insurance plans does new law apply to? Well, it applies to all plans that are regulated by the state of New York. Um, specifically, there's some mumbo jumbo about which ones they are, 32, Article 32 and 43 and 47. As a practical matter, there's about 5 million people who are enrolled in commercial health insurance plans in New York State, plus another million or so who are enrolled in whether it be the Child Health Insurance Program or the Essential Plan. Or, or get cover commercial health insurance coverage through New York's exchange, plus the other four point some odd million who are enrolled in Medicaid managed care plans in New York State. So it's over, mil, over, over 10 million New Yorkers for which these uh, plan, which these provisions are, are, are applied to. They do not apply to Medicare, uh, Medicaid fee for service, or plans that are, are self insured. So that frankly actually encompasses about another 8 million or so. Who are registered in your, in, in, who are, who are who types of insurance in New York State that for which this will not be applicable to. But again, it will be applicable to more than half of the New Yorkers um, who receive health and various forms of health insurance coverage. Um, and that will certainly, I know that will be an issue as we get into enforcement. But again, that's something that we want to help make sure people are aware of as we as we have this uh, program today. Next slide, please. So the question is, what does the law require of health insurance plans? Well, first and foremost, it requires health insurers to use evidence-based and peer-reviewed clinical review criteria that takes into the account the needs of patients. And specifically, there's an element in the statute that says that these clinical review criteria and um, these step therapy protocols have to take into account the needs of atypical patients. So sometimes a, a step therapy protocol might be based upon a certain type of patient population, but you may have patients particularly those with maybe multiple com comorbidities who it may not necessarily these step therapy protocols uh, will be easily applicable to. So the so the health the clinical review criteria has to take into account these atypical patients. Um, it helps to make sure that there is a standardized appeal process that can be used by the patient's physician to request a step therapy override. Um, it is, it, it assure, requires health insurers to use uh, recognized evidence-based and peer-reviewed clinical review criteria for the patient's condition, and and, and, and and very importantly, it helps to make sure that the physician and the patient are able to review this clinical review criteria when the patient or the physician makes a, makes a written request of that health insurance company when they want to find out what is the step therapy, what is the step therapy protocol that the plan is requiring that physician to follow. Um, next slide. Now, very importantly, there are five criteria that are listed in the statute for when and a physician or another prescriber can request an override of the health insurer step therapy protocol. Um, and, and it's funny, I've been trying to come up with a, a very simple acronym. Sometimes it helps to have an acronym, and I'm, I'm not sure I have a really good one. The best one I can come up with in this circumstance is BISCUIT, B-I-S-C-T. Um, and feel free to come up with one of your own, but essentially the five criteria, if I break it in the order of the BISCT, um, first of all, I will begin with, with the catch-all. It's best interest. So the, it makes it easier for a physician to be able to request an override of the health insurer step therapy protocol if the step therapy, if the medication the health insurer is saying that the patient should fail on first is not in the best interest of the patient because it will cause a significant barrier to a patient's adherence with his plan of care, or worsen a comorbid condition of the patient, or will decrease the patient's ability to achieve or maintain reasonable functional ability in performing daily activities. I mean, I know this example that's been raised before, such as a patient that might make a, a medication that might make a patient drowsy, and that could be very, very challenging based upon the line of work that a, that, a, that 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 patient might be might be working on. So. Best interest. This might, this might be a, a criteria that a physician can request for best interest. Why the this medication should be? Why this step therapy should be overridden by the plan? I ineffective. <clears throat> if the medication, if the the if the measure, if the if the medication that's requested by the or required by the health insurer is likely to be ineffective based upon the known clinical history and conditions 
of the patient and his or her drug, you know, hers or her drug regimen. So essentially, the physician knows based upon their experience with other patients with similar conditions that this medication is not likely to work. That gives the physician the ability to request and have the step therapy uh, provision overridden. Um, S, stable. And I actually think this is going to be one of the most common situations when a physician is going to be able to request a, an override of a health insurance step therapy protocol. If they're stable on the medication that requires that requires that requires another medication to fail first before they could go on to the medication from which they're stable. Oftentimes, because of new choices in health insurance coverage or persons changing jobs, they might change health insurance coverage. And you might be uh, stable on a particular medication, but as a result of changing insurance coverage, then the health plan might require the patient to fail on another medication first. And the physician knows that this medication that is that has to be has that is not available until you fail is um, they know that that's not going to work. So the physician is better able to request in that situation that the step therapy override be, be granted. C, contraindicated. Um, that the physician knows that, that this medication will likely cause an adverse reaction by or physical harm to the patient, such as a situation, um, and, and ultimately this kind of overlaps a little bit with T, has been tried and ineffective, has, has been tried um, but has been ineffective, whereas a medication was recommended previously and it didn't it didn't work, and that also might be a situation where if these, you know where the switched insurance company switched insurance company this allows a pathway for that physician to be able to request that uh, that the step therapy uh, uh, protocol be overridden. Uh, next slide. And as you're transitioning to the next slide, Mo, I'll just mention that these protections that you're outlining right here really are some of the strongest in the country. This bill is passed in a number of states, um, you know, or versions of the bill have passed in a number of states. And between this bill and Texas, those are two of the strongest bills in the country. Um, uh, any excuse to move to New York or, or Texas, right, if you're a chronic disease patient, but now you've got more of one. And then a gentle reminder that if you have uh, questions throughout this presentation, you can uh, submit them using the questions function uh, through the WebEx. Back over to you, Mo. Right. Thank you. And on the next slide. So, um, importantly, while previously, if you had, if a physician wanted to request a step therapy override, they would potentially do it within the context of New York's utilization review laws. New York's utilization review laws require a decision on a pre-authorization within three business days of the necessary material. The timeframes for utilization review for step therapy are actually much more expedited. So that a health insurer must respond to this request for step therapy override within 72 hours of the of the of the of, of the request, and not and, and the plan is not is not able to actually delay it through requesting additional information. They have to actually respond within 72 hours. They, 72 hours. They can request additional information, but that does not change the requirement that they have to respond within 72 hours. Furthermore, and perhaps even most most important, that if in a situation when it, it's actually considered to be an emergency. Um, an emergency basically means that, you know, that, that, the, that the patient will be in serious jeopardy without the prescription drug that the, that the, um, that have been prescribed by the, by the physician or other healthcare provider. The plan has to grant that request within 24 hours of the, of, of the request for the step therapy override. That's a very, very important change uh, that, that was part of the law, in addition to the fact that they have to respond within 72 hours. Um, and that means, and once that, and once that, um, once it's overridden, the health, the health plan is required to authorize immediate coverage for the prescription drug. They can't delay and say, "Okay, we'll provide coverage next week." That means that the coverage is effective immediately. Next slide. And this, frankly, is one of the, also the one of the most <coughs> changes that's part of this law. Traditionally, under New York uh, pre, uh, utilization review laws, if the plan did not respond to the physician's um, prior authorization request, it was, it was actually deemed to be an adverse determination, which would then force the physician to take the appeal to the next level. In the case of a step therapy request, if the plan fails to respond within the 72 or 24 hour time frame, it actually means that the step therapy protocol must be granted in favor of the patient. So again, a very, very pro-patient uh, provision on the state of New York, and hopefully will make, make these decisions happen very quickly and not 
and not uh, give insurance companies the ability to be able to request delay by requesting more and more information. So again, very important protection. Next slide, please. Um, and then, and then so the question is: Is what happens if you lose the request? If, if the plan denies your request for a step therapy override, as is the case when you request a uh, when you when you request a preauthorization, if the plan denies it, you then have a right to take an external appeal of that decision um, uh, to be reviewed by an independent external appeal agent. And specifically for physici physicians, that means it actually has to be reviewed by a physician the same or similar specialty as the as as the physician who's recommending the medication in these circumstances. And then you see on here is wh where you can click on to, um, to find more information about how to request an external appeal. Hopefully we'll not get to the point of having to request external appeals of these circumstances because while it's an important protection, it does certainly create delays in the process, but it is an important right um, should, should you ever need to avail yourself of that circumstance. Next slide, please. <laughs> So the new law took effect. It was actually signed into law on December 31st of 2016, and actually took effect immediately. It took effect on January. It took effect on January 1st, 2017. But as sort of the quirk of the way it was written, um, it was not. It would not be applicable to individual health insurance policies until 2018. But it would be applicable to um, group policies on a kind of a rolling basis across a, across the state of New York. Um, it, going through 2017. So there is certainly some situations where it's applicable to some health insurance plans already, and it's not going to be applicable to others. But our understanding, um, uh, Mar Marcy Savage, um, who, we, who was certainly the one who, 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 who well, many people played a part in this, Marcy Savage played, played a very extensive part in helping, in helping to get this bill enacted into law. When we had a meeting with the Department of Financial Services about that, what they indicated to us was that was was that these plans get uh, approved on a rolling basis? So, of, of the of the various group plans that are approved, um, some of them might some of them might be approved already, but many are not going to many are will start still still continue to be approved. But bottom line is, starting on January first, twenty eighteen, all New York health insurance plans regulated by the state of New York these these protections will be will be applicable to. Next slide, please. And then. The question is, is what role will the Department of Financial Services and the New York State Health Department play in implementing the new law? Um, the Department of Financial Services is authorized to promulgate rules to help implement, implement this law. Um, in fact, they developed a very lengthy question and answer uh, provision that helps flesh out sort of the five protections and also the rules regarding the time frames. But for example, when I talked about before about the time frames of having to respond, they're they're very clear that a health insurer could not delay the 72-hour uh, time period, the 24-hour time period, by requesting new information. They can request additional information, but it does not allow them to abrogate that responsibility to talk to uh, get back to them within within 72 hours. And again, there's a link to the Q&A if you want to read more information about it. Probably could be a subject of a much longer program uh, at a, at a later time. Next slide, please. And then in terms of how to file a complaint. If you find that you're having a situation where you think you have a very good case to be made um, about why a step therapy should be granted and maybe the insurer denied it and, and, and certainly obviously encourage you to take an external appeal, but there's also a variety of mechanisms that a, that a, that a physician or a patient could, could, take, could go to to help make sure that they see if these, if these concerns can be addressed. The Department of Financial Services has a, has a, has a met methodology in which to file a complaint. Um, so does the uh, so does the Department of, of, of Health for Medicaid managed care plans, and then also we found sometimes that the going to the Attorney General's office can also be very can also be very very helpful in resolving some of these health health insurance complaints too. Certainly, the Medical Society uh, is, is, wants to be able to generate information from physicians about how this process is working, so that we can bring it to the attention of the Department of Financial Services or DOH or the AG's office if we see a pattern of inappropriate denials taking place. And again, certainly I, know, I'm, I'm, I assume that's going to be the case with a lot of the patient advocacy organizations who are also very involved in uh, getting, this bill, just getting, this, uh, getting this bill passed into law. Um, oftentimes we find that you, 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 know, you think a bill is going to be written and interpreted a certain way and you work really hard to get it done, and then you find out after it gets implemented into law that it's being interpreted in a way that's not what you, what you intended. So it's inherent. It's imperative that we, when we 
generate that information to be able to bring these concerns to our various state agencies who I think really want to be helpful in making sure this law is a success and does everything we intended to do. Um, next slide. Well, th thank you, Mo. Thank you a lot. Really, really great comprehensive perspective there, and thank for thank you for all the great work you did on on this uh, legislation. You mentioned Marcy Savage, who was instrumental in, in kind of coordinating us all. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, hand this over to uh, Dr. Medeski uh, to provide some physician perspective of things. So, uh, Dr. Medeski, as an as an internist, could you please provide us your perspective on how step therapy affects your practice and, and the treatment of your patients? Uh, sure. Uh, it uh, unfortunately now seems to affect us every day. Uh, I think with people uh, changing insurance companies uh, routinely every couple years and insurance companies changing formularies uh, regularly, uh, there's a lot of churn of stable patients who are on uh, well-established regimens that really don't need to be messed with. So I, I think one of the opportunities this provides is to, uh, you know, document that the patient's on a stable regimen and they should not have a risk of a decompensation uh, due to uh, change in their insurance or insurance company. And, and certainly, although it doesn't happen commonly, it does happen, and I think that's an important patient protection. Um, the uh, other areas that we see it in uh, particularly are in... Uh, uh, you know, moving towards a more expensive medication when you've already uh, tried some things that don't work. Uh, I think this provides an expedited process to move that forward. Uh, that's particularly appropriate, I think, to uh, patients who have uh, immune-related diseases, which now have so many different treatment options and so much nuance that uh, understandably the insurance companies are trying to uh, hold down costs to uh, make an effective or make a reasonable premium. But we treat individual patients, and the physician basically has the best knowledge about what's best for the patient. Great. Thank you for that. Could, could you provide an example of a recent step therapy uh, situation that you had in which uh, you would use uh, the new Chapter 512 to gain a successful override? Uh, I think one of the common areas that we're seeing right now, again, is if a patient has changed insurance carriers, uh, they'll have a different formulary. I'll have them on a certain, uh, let's assume a non-steroidal, uh, which uh, was acceptable under the old, uh, old insurance company, and now they have new insurance that it's not on their formulary. Well, we'd already done most of the experimentation to get to that, and there may be specific clinical reasons in terms of comorbidities that we don't want to change them. This should give us uh, more ammunition and a better uh, process to not interrupt the patient's therapy and have to put them through a series of trials again. Great, thank you. you know, and as we go into open enrollment uh, period, I think it's important to remember these protections as you're selecting a health care plan. If you've got a health care plan through your employer that is um, either limited or is employing a great deal of utilization tools, it may behoove you to take a look onto the individual marketplace during open enrollment and see if there's a product out there to, uh, that would better serve you. Um, there are tons of resources out there for uh, assistance in selecting a plan, uh, but to be a little bit selfish, if you want to go to the uh, psoriasis.org, we've got some great uh, tools up right now about open enrollment. Going back to Dr. Uh, Medeski, could you, you know, based on the step therapy overrides that are, have been passed, could you kind of walk through us how you're going to request and how your office is going to request an override moving forward in the future? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we, and actually, before the webinar started, we were doing some brainstorming. And I, I think the, uh, the New York State uh, uh, guidance is particularly helpful in, in Mo's attempt to come up with an acronym. I came up with something called CLIPS, which it gets most of it. Uh, but I, I think probably systematizing that will be useful. So we, we plan on developing a form that will have those uh, clear exceptions. So, uh, you know, contraindication based on previous treatment, uh, likely ineffective based on knowledge of the patient. And again, in, in changing insurance companies for patients, which is very common, uh, the new insurance company doesn't, doesn't have any, uh, any even uh, claims data history to know what patients have been tried on. I think being able to document that quickly and easily will be the, the most important thing for not disrupting patients. Uh, I had actually uh, uh, spoken with uh, Mr. Oster uh, again prior to this that we're going to try and develop a, uh, 
a form uh, through the medical society that we'll make available uh, that would be sort of a checklist with those things that you can use for your submission. So we hope to have that available within a reasonable time frame and have that on our website available to people. And that's uh, misny.org, M-S-S-N-Y dot O-R-G. Great. Well, thank you for your perspectives here. Um, you know, one of the questions we ended up getting, and you can advance to the next slide, please. One of the questions we ended up getting prior to um, this uh, meeting was really who was involved in getting this across the finish line and what did it take? And, and Mo, do you want to speak to that for a couple uh, seconds? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, it, this truly was a, 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 group, a group effort in getting this bill passed, um, you know, several, you know, several different groups weighed in, uh, weighed in, weighed in support with their legislators, and I know there was also a lot, a lot of different gr groups who had been quoted in various newspaper articles or on, on various political shows, and, and over the next couple slides, you'll see a substantial list of it, and certainly there were, you know, you know, MISNI, many, many other specialty societies had been involved in it as well, too. I know a couple of the name have been American College of Physicians and Academy of Family Physicians and the Rheumatology Society. Then, of course, very, very, a lot of patient organizations. And I would feel bad if I started listing off some of them, but <clears throat> a couple of ones I know were really heavily involved with the MS Society. Certainly the Lupus Alliance, uh, Catherine Arnston from Lupus Alliance, I think made a, had, well, this was a multi-year uh, multi-year effort, uh, uh, you know, on her part to try and get something passed into law. The Epilepsy Foundation, the Arthritis Foundation, I, I, I really feel that, you know, I, I, hope, I hope I'm not forgetting any, uh, any, any groups, but there are so many different, Mental Health Association was extensively involved in it. I think there were so many circumstances with patients who have very critical needs uh, and that oftentimes they find that medications that they were that they that they had had the step were really having an adverse impl impl implication on their on on their on their health. That that's why there were so many groups involved in it because it was so important across a wide spectrum of uh, patients and conditions that physicians see across the state of New York. Thanks, Mo. And we do have a couple questions, and we have time for a few questions, and a few have been submitted. And and uh, this is an interesting one. I haven't gotten this one. We do these webinars uh, every time we pass a bill, which we've done in in uh, several states now. And the person asks, did you learn anything helpful about insurers' perspectives on treatments for certain conditions resulting from their opposition to this bill and as it was moving through the legislative process? So, so again, did we learn anything helpful about insurance perspectives on, on treatment for certain conditions? And I'll, I'll take that one, and then I can open it up to you, Mo. So, you know, uh, our, our interactions with insurers in, in the state of New York, New York was a little bit different than it has been in other states in that they were uh, a little bit more opposed to the bill. Um, in other states, a lot of insurers have acknowledged that guardrails need to be placed around step therapy and have recognized that this is really a common sense approach to um, what is really kind of an outlier. It, it, it is an issue, of course, but we're not trying to seek a ban on step therapy. This is about exceptions to the process, right? So, but in regards to certain conditions, you know, I, that kind of evidence really wasn't brought to the table. I think that the, the opposition argument was more based on cost, and, and we always had a lot of uh, trouble getting really accurate information uh, that wasn't just kind of a big six-figure number from insurers. Um, but I, I do want to thank the insurers. You know, they did come to the table and attempt to negotiate this bill in in good faith, and, and we appreciated that. Mo, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think I think you 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 framed it well, Patrick. I think there had been a a bit of a misperception as this bill was going through the legislative process that we were seeking to prohibit, uh, basically prohibit step therapy, and also to, it would create a basically a prescriber prevails type system that we see within some drug classes within Medicaid managed care. But this is not. This is not that. This is this is essentially just providing stronger criteria in, in appropriate circumstances. Physicians all the time. I'm sure Dr. Medeski could probably talk about many situations when a step therapy protocol is perfectly appropriate. It's just in those relatively, I'm sure, rare circumstances when when a particular medication might be better for a patient based upon a certain circumstance. This just gives greater tools for that physician to be able to, or physician or other prescriber be able to request an override of those circumstances. I think it was, I do think there was, you know, certainly an education for a lot of physicians about how those circumstances are, are, are handled, are handled now, or handled prior to the implementation of the law. 
And I think what this now does as much as anything is basically just gives a clear way 